If you could uh, remain standing as you already are, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to read Ephesians, uh, actually Esther, chapter four. So if you have a Bible, you can grab it. If not, you can listen to me. I'm going to read the entire chapter of Esther, chapter four. Um, Emmanuel asked me to to continue with uh, the book of Esther, so I hope you've been enjoying that, and uh, I'm going to going to continue where we've been at. So Esther, chapter four. I'll give you a couple seconds to find your page while I take it. Okay, here we go. Esther 4. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate. For no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. And many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai, so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come in to the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will, will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Maybe see it. There's some, uh, there's some famous quotes in there, uh, especially the last few verses there you've probably heard before. Um, and our goal over these past several weeks has been to, to really foster biblical literacy here uh, in our church and among our people to search the Word, to know it, and hold each other accountable, including in church leadership. Um, so not to give things away too much, but I may have gotten the easy chapter of Esther, um, there's some pretty, uh, pretty well-known uh, phrases in there, uh, but uh, there's a turning point coming as well, and so I hope you all have been, have been enjoying uh, where Emmanuel has been taking us through this. And you yourselves maybe have been uh, reading as well. This is a book that you can sit down and read all together. Uh, we've also been emailing uh, some, some study notes and things you can prepare in advance, but even if you have not, 
Uh, I really believe there's something that God can teach you uh, here today in this moment. So please pay attention. I know there's, uh, we welcome the kids that are here. Um, that's awesome. So if, if there's somebody crying, that's no problem. I'm going to continue. Um, and I know we've got uh, folks going to a mission trip today as well, too. So a lot going on in the life of the church. So um, something that Emmanuel said a few weeks ago um, that I think we want to remind ourselves of is to see that God is working even when his name is not mentioned. So do you remember him saying that? Do you remember that the book of Esther actually doesn't have the, the name of God in it? So it's pretty amazing. So let me say that again. Just, just think about that. Not mention the entire book. But that doesn't take away from uh, our need to feed on it on our own. And um, so some of the points, and I don't know if I've got, okay, if you could go to the next slide, I'm just going to go ahead and give you um, the points that I want you to keep in mind that God has been ministering to me as I prepared for this uh, this week. And if, there's, if they're not up there, actually they are, there we go, thank you. So um, if you notice from the text that disaster was coming, there was a decree. And uh, the Jewish people were going to be annihilated. So, um, and one of the things that I want you to take away from this, and we'll get into this a little bit uh, for a few minutes, and I'm, I will keep this a little short. Um, when disaster is coming, take action. And don't be complacent. Uh, do something. And the next one is when making a hard choice, count the cost. So the cost in this case was life. So it was life or death. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and kind of along those same lines, the other thing that I got out of this that I want to share with you is to, when there is decisions to be made, um, don't think about just those big decisions. Make it a lifestyle. And so the phrase that I want to leave you with is, 1,000 small decisions are just as important to God as a single big one. And so the single big one that we had here in Esther is life or death. And Esther and her people, Mordecai, her uncle, and they knew that annihilation would be coming. So uh, just to set the scene just a little bit, and I did bring um, a piece of burlap just to illustrate sackcloth as well, and a scepter for those of you that like audio visuals, even though it's a stick, it's just going to help help us uh, remember, it's, it's a very nice stick. My, my son likes to carve wood and, and uh, let me borrow it this morning. So uh, a little bit of details about Esther and Mordecai. She grew up as an orphan. Uh, you may remember that. Uh, her uncle Mordecai raised her, took care of her. She didn't have parents at the time. Uh, they were both Jews. After King Xerxes banned his queen, you remember Vashti, uh, from his presence, he collected the harem of beautiful young women. And you may remember the phrase beauty pageant, or you may have remembered that in the early chapters of Esther. And so Esther eventually became selected as his queen. And Esther and Mordecai, so they were separated, but they did stay in touch. They stayed in contact. And so you might remember the illustration we saw, the image of the King's Gate, archaeologically. Um, it's, it's still, there's still something there to be seen of it. And there was, so Mordecai went on the outside, and if you remember from the verses we read, that there was some communication happening between the two, through uh, the, the servants, the eunuchs. So you also remember maybe there was, uh, there was a decree made, or an edict. Haman talked uh, to King Xerxes, he talked him into making a law that all Jews would be killed by the end of the year, so several months later. So there was this sense of lament, so you might remember that from the phrase too. And even going back, uh, if you've got your Bibles open still, uh, you can look at uh, the very end of chapter 3. Um, so after this edict had been made, and you may remember that there was 127 provinces of this gigantic Persian uh, empire, and this decree had gone out. And so at the end of chapter 3, uh, the king and Haman sit down to drink. This is in verse 15. They sat down to drink. So you can just kind of imagine them sitting back and just like, okay, we have just done this thing. We have just put this message out to our, to our massive kingdom. But the city that they're in, what's it say? Was thrown into confusion, or your Bibles may say, perplexed. So maybe they're questioning, what did we just do? Here are these hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people, I'm not sure what the number was, 
Um, but those people, we are going to allow them to be annihilated. And someone set aside money, or they were willing to, and you may, may remember uh, from the previous chapter, if you were here, 10,000 talents in today's dollars, three and a half billion dollars. So a lot of money was be willing to put up to make this genocide happen. And so they may be in the process of losing all of their uh, workers, uh, some people that were in their city doing the things that needed to be done. And so some confusion, you could say, was going on. And the sound of lament, weeping and wailing, and that is just not something that we even see today. This idea of someone when they are so distressed that they would out loud, they would illustrate that. Walking around um, and, and wearing this sackcloth. So I've got this piece of, um, and thank you Greg for suggesting, uh, Greg Presnell, a piece of burlap. So, no, it's not black goat hair, but it gives you an idea. Would you want to wear this? Probably not. Um, but it, it gives you an idea of, this is what, if you can imagine, a uh, black goat hair. Um, just kind of rough and coarse if you've been to, been to a petting zoo or if you've been around some goats and you, you pet them. It's not real soft. And that was a representation of their inward heart condition of sorrow and desolation. And thinking that, okay, we are, we are going to be experiencing this annihilation of our friends and our loved ones and our family members. And if the Bible says sackcloth and ashes, ashes was an additional layer that represented what we saw uh, in other parts of the Bible as actually a national disaster. So this is a nationwide thing, not just personal of, lo of losing a loved one, but actually this is happening to all of my people. So sackcloth and ashes as that extra layer of uh, signifying that desolation. It uh, also happened in, with the Ninevites, if you know the story of Jonah. Any kids out there that know the story of Jonah? Yeah? Anybody? All right, I see a hand. Got some listeners, good. So, uh, Jonah spoke to the Ninevites, and they responded with sackcloth and ashes as well. So back to Esther and Mordecai, um, they're, them as a people, there's this contrast of individual death versus genocide, and I know that in some times you may have heard of uh, Esther being put kind of on this um, focus of being someone who should be followed or studied or um, someone to, uh, that we should dig deeper into. Is this... But I don't want to put her on a pedestal either, because she wasn't perfect, and we don't know that much about her. Um, and if you also think about where she was, she was in this, really under lock and key, uh, for five years. Esther is, she really doesn't have any choice. And so, just imagine yourself in her position of, I have an opportunity here, and maybe it's my also way to get out. So. Um, that was something that God ministered to me on, is um, He can use us as well in the situations that we're in, that even if we don't know the exact choice to make, or the perfect decision, God's plan still has a way of happening. And in this case, in this way, uh, He did use Esther. So, do we see a continual thread of the good news of Jesus Christ in here? Not so much. Maybe that's a little bit jarring, but we also see God's providence as well. We also see, we don't see a direct example of uh, a Savior, but we do see Mordecai talking about that this deliverance of the Jews would come from somewhere else. So that tells us that he knows, and he knew about those prophecies from old, that God would provide throughout history. And so Esther and Mordecai are one part of that overall story. So I think that's a big takeaway for us. So whether it's a big decision or a small decision, choice exists for a time. I think about myself, and I don't want to make this uh, message today something that is so abstract that we can't apply it um, to our lives. And so I think that is something that um, we want to be able to, when we leave here today, think, okay, what about all the little things 
that I have to do? What about the things that have been really speaking to me? Uh, maybe it's just a dripping faucet that I haven't fixed yet. Or maybe it's the, the noise under the car hood. You know, those little things, we can still ask for the Lord's help and to take action, but allowing them to continue and not do anything, eventually there will be a time when something has to be done. And so I think God can use a story like this to show us that there are thousands of little decisions that we make throughout the day. They're not always, and throughout our lives, they're not always uh, significant, life-changing, life-and-death situations. But God is still using us, even if we don't know. So think about that. So if He can be faithful in those small decisions, then why wouldn't we apply that same effort of prayer, uh, or even fasting, in those small ones as well? So if we think about the big ones and the small ones. So maybe that's a thought uh, for us, is are we only praying and asking God to help us when we have something big that's coming up. When we have something, maybe it's not life and death, but it's a, it's a big decision. Where should we move? What should our career choice be? Where do I want to come to college? I'm going to be having those conversations with my growing teenagers in the next few years, so I'm sure I'll be having the same conversation uh, with them as well. I think about my own grandmother as well. Um, and she was a German immigrant. She was someone who... Uh, she came through Ellis Island in the 1950s with my mother, um, who was barely even two years old. And I can remember her uh, being nearby her, and she was constantly uh, talking to God while she was doing what she was doing. And I thought about that at the time and then again later. And you may even know people like that. And you might even realize that what... Why am I not that way? Um, but other people that are around me might think they're kind of kind of nutty, kind of crazy. Why would someone be having that ongoing conversation with the Lord? But inside, we really know that that's, that's good. That's what we want. We want to be having that continual conversation. And as I reflect back on that, uh, and that heritage uh, that I had, and I'm thankful for the Lord for that, I realized that all that she had gone through and being in Germany and being around uh, destruction and uh, movement of people groups uh, leading up to World War II and those things was probably something that drove her to that. So um, just, a, just a little personal insight there I wanted to share that um, that is something that we can uh, strive for is a continual uh, talk with God, talking and walking. And when I think about uh, another reference from the Garden of Eden as well, when you think about Adam and Eve and that perfectness of the creation of the garden that God made, and how uh, the Bible says that they heard the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Wouldn't that have been cool? So instead, of being, instead of being afraid to be seen by God, that they would be willing to walk with Him, walk with Him and experience time with Him. We can do that now. We have Jesus. Jesus has made it possible for us to have that relationship. And one day, we'll be returned to perfection. But on this side of heaven, we can continually have that relationship with Jesus. So, um, I want to leave you with um, and touch on those points one more time. And um, if I could have those, thank you, yeah, those final three. And I'm going to talk through these um, just to leave you with uh, what I got of this. And I hope it's helpful and, and edifying to you as well. When disaster is coming, take action, not complacency. So, and maybe you haven't had a disaster, and maybe you don't have one coming up, and that's great. That's wonderful. Um, but I think we get hung up in what is it exactly that I do? How should I respond? But I think if we trust in the Lord that His faithfulness will be there regardless, that is reassuring. And then again, uh, when making a hard choice, count the cost. Uh, so we're not talking about the cost of the dollars there. Uh, we're talking about, um, but it could be. Uh, he'll be with us either way. Um, and one thing that I got out of this that I want to share too is 
to not think so highly of ourselves that we're God's only option. And so I think that is a really strong uh, message that we do get out of this. Mordecai knew that he had he knew that, that God would deliver the Jews through some way. And Esther had the opportunity. And once she realized that, then we'll find out next week how she took action. So, but let's not think so highly of ourselves that we're the only way that this can happen. So God still has a plan. And that is the great thing about his providence. And then, of course, the last one, if you only leave with one application, is to make it a lifestyle. A thousand small decisions are just as important as, as a single big one. Amen? So as I wrap up here and we close, um, I want us to think about our action steps as dads. Happy Father's Day, dads. Nope. As moms, as children, as co-workers and neighbors. Are we leaving space in our lifestyle for those decisions, for deliverance of the gospel? So are we leaving enough room in there so that God can speak in? Are our, are our schedules and our lives just so packed that there's no way for God to do something different uh, with what he has in that moment? So we have some folks heading out on a mission trip so, today. So apparently those folks have room in their space and their schedule uh, or they've made it so anyway. Um, and we're thankful for that. We'll pray for you guys in a minute. Our country continues to struggle with big topics like gun violence, racial tension, rising inflation. Anybody feeling that pain? Um, seeing, seeing the gas pumps or whatever it might be. Um, the lives of unborn children. There are big, big topics that we're facing. We see conflict in our world and even in places where our missionaries are wishing to return. So you might have heard uh, from the Warners a while back, hoping to go back to Ukraine. Tough times over there. Uh, seems like the rest of the world in some ways has forgotten uh, about the difficulties that's going on over there. I am so thankful that God gives us the ability to be salt and light. So not to just push away those big topics and say, you know what, those are too big for me. We still have the opportunity to speak into those with the good news of Jesus Christ. And to actually share our opinion. Ask someone else's their opinion. That's okay. Uh, we, are, we are not called to, to just stay behind our four walls. So as a church, um, you'll be hearing more about um, our priority toward prayer. Uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we're going to be allowing some opportunities for corporate prayer. You may have seen or heard of a prayer ministry uh, that's going on, and that is another way uh, that you can take action, and it is not a small thing. So thank you for listening. Um, as we wrap up and I prepare to pray, I would like to have uh, the folks that are going to Big Creek, Kentucky to stand, if you could, and I'm going to talk just for a moment uh, about this mission trip. Nice looking bunch. All right. You guys are getting ready to get on the road. All right. So the Big Creek Mission is a serving and learning week-long mission that our middle school and high schoolers have been attending for several years now. It takes a significant amount of time and resources to make this trip happen. But I've seen the dividends that it's, that it's paid. I've gone a few times myself, and so I'm excited for those of you that are going, some of you for the first time. Who's going for the first time? All right. Very good. Well, thanks for serving in this way. So if you're nearby, and if you could extend a hand toward these folks and bow with me in prayer, and we'll pray for them and for the church. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for this group of people uh, that are going out to serve in Kentucky. Uh, and Lord, I pray that you minister to their hearts as well and change their hearts and draw them closer to you. I also pray for the people that are working there from the other churches and for the staff, Lord, that you sustain them, some of our, some of our own staff, uh, some of our own people that are working there uh, as the rest of the summer as well. And I pray for the people of Eastern Kentucky, Lord, that have economic uh, challenges, um, but hearts that are open, Lord, and I pray that 
um, you would continue to provide the, the financial resources and the people resources that are needed there to sustain that ministry. Lord, I also pray for our other missionaries, uh, specifically the Warners and our other missionaries around the world uh, that are seeking uh, comfort and stability and direction in their various countries. And I pray for us as a church, Lord, as we move closer toward prayer and asking, Lord, for you to change things with your power, not our own. I thank you for this, uh, for this time today, for the dedication of these children, uh, and I pray for their families, Lord, that all their days, Lord, that they would grow to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.